All right. Uh, let's take a look. Uh, I'm going to have everyone have a few different documents out. So the reading test one, everyone want to have a copy of that, as well as some blank paper. And this is, these are the same things that I would ask students to have out during um, a tutoring session with them. And then also in the next gen reading strategies packet, you turn to the page that says annotation tools stage one. This is um, probably the most important and informative piece about the actual process of tutoring students for how to um, decode and make sense of the questions in this packet. So um, the first thing I want to talk about is that annotation tool and the questions contained there. So what is the question asking me to do? The first thing I want students to look at um, is the actual question because they can look for keywords in that question that helps make their reading more focused. And that's uh, ultimately going to um, help them move away from the extraneous information that's intentionally embedded in the passage. Um, so uh, the next thing I want to do is look at the main idea of the passage. So understanding the difference between main ideas and supporting details. For some of us, that's rather intuitive, but for students, it's not always intuitive. Um, and many of the questions, in fact, at least half of the practice test questions I've seen have been um, questions asking them to identify the primary purpose or the main idea of um, that passage. So being able to distinguish between what the passage is attempting to convey or prove and the details that the author is including to support that idea. Being able to distinguish the difference between those um, is ultimately very important in terms of answering the question correctly because some of those details, when you have the multiple choice questions, some of those details um, will be possible answers. And uh, of course, if a student isn't sure what the main idea is, um, they're likely to select one of those supporting details and then not have gotten the answer correct. But it's misleading for them because it's actually in the question. It could be a word for word quote from the question. So um, that's something that we definitely want to look at and I'll explain that more when we have some examples to go through. Um, another thing is identifying the pattern of the um, passage. So. For some students, this is a little confusing. For other students, it makes perfect sense. So I would say um, test it out with each student. Try talking about primary purpose questions, cause and effect questions. If it seems to be clicking with them, then, um, then I would follow that routine with them. That makes sense to them. If, it, if you're looking in their eyes and you're seeing that this is just creating more confusion, back away from it, because there's other approaches that we can take. Um, they're not quite as precise, but um, they can be effective without adding additional confusion. So uh, obviously, and this is a standard um, test taking skill, but it, it's one that um, really is helpful here. And so that is, are there, asking the question, are there any answer options that are not stated or discussed at all? Okay, because sometimes there will be things put in there that sound like they make sense, but the author of the passage didn't actually touch on that idea at all. Um, another thing, so you're making an inference, but you don't really have information, enough information in the passage to draw that conclusion. So if so, I can cross those off, off as options. Um, also, going back to that step number one, looking at the keywords, if it's saying which one of these is true, I know that only one can be correct. So I'm looking for, I can cross out the ones that I can disprove. Or if there's a keyword in the question that says, which one of these would challenge the assumption made in the passage? Okay, I still know that only one could be correct, but it's actually the one that disproves what the passage is about. So I know this sounds um, a, a little bit abstract without looking at the um, questions just yet, but I wanna kind of go off down this list and, and make sure that we're all talking about the same things 
once I get into the questions. So, and then finally, we want to look for metaphors or figurative language. Um, for students who are English lang language learners, this can be um, a real sticky point, figuring out what is figurative language, what's happening when I see it, um, and how do I figure out what it really means. Um, so uh, we'll do, there's a, two questions in this packet that we'll go through that use figurative language, and we'll kind of unpack those and how you would approach um, uh, any student really, but especially those English language learners uh, who are apt to look up dictionary definitions and, and really rely on those and, and not be able to make sense of metaphorical um, language. And then finally, what words in both the passage and the answer options do I not know? This is very important um, because in addition to the questions that are strictly vocabulary, right, there's questions that are completely just asking you fill in the blank with the correct word, and there's four obscure words for them to choose from. Um, I have two recommendations when they're coming across words they don't know in um, vocabulary-based questions to be making notes of those words, looking them up writing down a synonym for them, okay? Not the definition, just a synonym, okay? Um, the second thing is to be looking through the passages and the questions for words that they see coming up frequently. Um, like we've identified the word phenomenon is one that comes up in a lot of passages or, or questions. And so knowing what that means or challenge, um, knowing what those words mean in context is important. So keeping that on their kind of running list. We don't want that vocab list they're keeping to get too long because, you know, we have a finite amount of time to make this efficient and effective, uh, but we really do want to be targeting things that we're likely to see in the actual exam. So um, those are my basic uh, uh, recommendations for that. I, I would also approach vocabulary from the um, angle of using context clues. If I can read through something, skip over a word I don't know, and still make sense of that sentence, I probably don't need to worry about it too much. If I have to skip over two or three words, or if I have to skip over a word and the passage no longer makes sense to me, I've lost, then that's something we probably want to look at more closely while we're practicing, okay? All right, so those are my basic guidelines. They're listed on um, the annotation tool, stage one. I'm actually going to switch to the document camera now so you can see the things that I'm looking at. And um, we'll start working through some of these sample questions. All right. Can you guys see the sample? Yes, you can. Wonderful. Make sure it's in there. So this was the tool that I was just reviewing with you and um, giving you some additional points about. So students should have this. This is a good place for them to start. You'll notice that it's question based. So students can be asking these questions um, to themselves as they're working through practice tests. This completely blank piece of paper is a testing student's best friend because this and this are things that they can take into the test with them. These are the only things they can take into the test with them, but they're enough. Um, two of the most effective things that I've had students doing with the blank pieces of paper are every time they come to a question, I have them write, for that question, go ahead and put the number and put the letter options, okay? Because uh, we all know that process of elimination is an effective strategy, but when you're looking at a computer screen, it's hard to make your eyes go away from those things and only focus in on the important ones. So if they could actually physically write those options down and write things like, I know it's not A, maybe B, um, 
maybe C, not D, okay? Then they can go back to B and C and take a closer look at those. Because they have, it's an untimed test, they can go back and relook and, and, and test their results um, as, as much as they need to. And I encourage students to take their time doing that as well. So let's walk through the um, first question. And um, so I'll show you the question because I want you to see, uh, make sure that we're looking at the same thing. And then I'm going to show you what I am annotating on the paper, okay? At the, what the student would likely be writing on the paper, okay? So passage one is the one about um, cats, lions. Um, so let's jump into this one. Uh, for this question, I have students take a look um, at words they understand and to write this out in their own words, okay, so that they're following along and they're able to understand what it is that they believe is happening. So, <clears throat> I see, I have always been wary of cats and now walking alongside a 500 pound African black maned lion, I know why, okay. This is a really long sentence with a lot of extra words. So students can usually say something like, walking by a large lion, right? Well, it can eat me. The next line says, they remind me there's something higher than I am on the food chain. So that reinforces this idea. Joseph, okay. Joseph the lion, this is the lion's name. So I'm gonna say Joseph the lion. Beside me is trained. So he is trained. The best lion in the business, his owner says, beaming. I've had, when I'm working with students, often they say to me, what is beaming? What does that adjective mean? Um, Honestly, in the context of this particular question, it's not all that important. Um, but whenever they ask questions like that, I want to take the time to answer them uh, because a lot of times that's a cultural thing or a figurative language um, issue. And so I don't want them to be confused by it. So beaming, I would, I would give them the synonym or I would give them a situation. Think of a light beam. What does it do? It shines. So if a person is speaking and they are beaming, what do you think they feel? And they are proud, right? They'll say they're proud, they're happy, they're excited. So, uh, but not really important in terms of the context of this question. So, Joseph has starred in movies and posed for film animators. Okay, works in movies. Joseph is a big time Hollywood cat. All right. But Joseph is not tame. Ah. First of all, they've started a new paragraph here. When there's a paragraph break and it starts with another piece of information, that is an indicator that we're looking at a new idea now. Okay, so the ideas in this section are different than the ideas expressed in this section. So, I might put a line here to say, this is a new idea. The lion is not tame. So he works, helps making movies, but he's still a lion. It says no big cat ever is. A difficult fact to ignore as we climb the hills near the ranch Joseph calls home. He strides with the fluidity of unfurling silk. Okay, so we have some metaphorical figurative language here. So I'll ask students, what words in the sentence do you recognize? And they'll often say silk, okay? Um, and I say, okay, so unfurling is really not all that important if you know what silk is. He walks, it looks like silk, right? You get an image of that. Deliberately, not an ounce of tentative in each footfall. Cats don't rent, they own, it is said. So the first thing that gives us an indication that 
this is figurative, figurative language is a student will immediately recognize that, well, cats don't run things or own things. They don't buy things. Um, so we know we're dealing with figurative language. If we look at the question, the question specifically says, it refers to this quote. In context, the second quote, uh, quotation in passage one, cats dot 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 own serves to do what? So we know that we're getting close to something that's very important here. And then the final line says, lions own everything. So I would ask a student to distinguish for me the difference between renting and owning something. For a human, what is the difference, okay? So renting is more temporary. How do you treat a home or an apartment that you rent? You don't, you tread lightly, you don't paint, you don't do a lot of work on it because it really isn't yours. In contrast, something that you own, you can do what you want with it. And so then I say, let's go back and read what you've written. You're walking by a large lion, you recognize that it can eat you, it's trained to do movies, but it's not tame. Cats don't rent, they own, they do what they want. Lions own everything. Now I need to figure out what it is in context that that means. So <clears throat> so as I'm looking at these possible questions, I have, um, I see in context, which typically means we're looking at a metaphor or a phrase, serves to, so what's its purpose? Why did the author include this quote? So um, the first one, present an alternative view of a troubling situation. This is not even mentioned, it's not even implied. This is not an alternative view of anything, so it's not implied. So if I'm on that annotating sheet, I'm going to mark A right out. B, to reinforce an observation by using metaphor. Well, just because I, I know that I've seen figurative language as a student, I'm going to just put an M there, even if I'm not sure, because I've seen figurative language, so I want to make sure that I at least consider that one. Uh, C, warn the reader of an existing danger. Hmm? There's not really a warning, the reader's not in danger, it's not talking to the reader as if the reader's gonna go visit a lion, so I would cross out C. And then finally D, cite an authority to support a point. That never happens here, there are no authorities cited here, so D. So I can go back to B, and it was a strong M, it was a strong maybe. For me, I like to go back in and test that um, because it's entirely possible and often probable that you might discount one of the correct answers, okay, in your first go around. So I just want students to go back and test their answer. So if I say that I think the answer is to reinforce an observation by using a metaphor, I don't want to just leave it at that and say, well, it couldn't have been A, C, or D, so it must be B. I want them to go in and, and test that, see if it's true. So is this is this a metaphor? Yes, we have figurative language. Yes, that is a metaphor. Is it reinforcing an observation, something that this person saw firsthand? Yes. Since that's true, I can be really confident moving forward that the answer to that question is B. Okay, it's not my best guess. I've actually put some thought into it, tested my theory, and come up with an answer that's appropriate. So um, a lot of times students will be um, eager to get through the test. So uh, I, I also let them know that they're allowed to pause and take bathroom breaks. They're allowed to um, get up, move around, go get a drink, step outside. Uh, I don't want them to rush through the test because 
um, we all reach a certain point, especially if we're doing very close reading and analyzing and thinking where we're ready to just be done. And of course, the problem with that is that once our brain gets into the I'm just ready to be done phase, we, we just start answering questions without really analyzing them. And so we can see a student do very well on the first half of the test and then just kind of dwindle on the second. So we are spending a lot of time with each question, but um, if students know how to use that time and also when it's time for them to take a break, refresh and come back, then we can actually feel confident using this much time for each question. Um, all right, so I probably won't spend as much time on the rest of the questions as I did on that one, but I wanted to kind of walk you through my thinking. Uh, so always for every question, I'll have them doing the same thing. So we're going to work, move on to two, A, B, C, D. This is where it all starts. Sometimes they'll need to annotate. Sometimes they'll need to draw. Some, sometimes they won't, but at least they've got the space to do it. So the second um, passage is about women's suffrage. In the United States, again, a lot of uh, students will not be familiar with the term suffrage, and so we have to figure out what that, um, if that's important, and if it is important, what it means. So, um, for me, one thing that I have students do often when they're rewriting, if they come across a word that they don't know, like in this case, it's a century ago, opponents of women's uh, suffrage, I might just say, Women's S in the US scoffed. Again, another vocab word. So I might just write it, even though I don't know what it means. So it's not confused with the first S. At the notion that extending the vote, so they scoffed that women voting would make any difference. So especially on some of these questions that are um, particularly tricky to navigate, keeping a point by point list of what they understand they just read. Okay, what do I understand of what I just read and seeing how it evolves can be helpful. Uh, then there's a quote, women will vote with their husbands was the commonly accepted wisdom. So they thought, they would vote the same as their husbands. So it'd be twice as many votes, but they'd all still end up the same. Uh, this was an argument made in the absence of evidence. So what is evidence? What is the absence of it? So most students from school know what it means to be absent or to miss something. So we have, we have missing evidence. That means this was just a guess. They didn't know this was a guess. So I would write that down. Um, ever since women won the vote, researchers have been keeping close track of female voting behavior. A gender gap in voting behavior has been found in the United States as in many other countries. So, okay, researchers are tracking it. They found a gender gap, and we'll come back to this term later because it's embedded in one of the questions, which makes it um, a little difficult to flesh out. Uh, in the US, the 1994 and 96 elections showed the largest gaps ever between candidates favored by women and those favored by men. So they're explaining what they mean by gender gap, okay? So women and men, we're voting differently. That question is a primary purpose question. Primary purpose always means we are looking for the main idea, not the supporting details, but the main idea. So um, 
I'm going to go back and see if I can figure out what the difference is. My question or my possible answers, and I have A, B, C, D here. So describe the evolution of a gender gap in the United States. Does this happen in, in the passage? It does, um, but there, it's not what every sentence in the passage is supporting. It's a supporting detail because it's not the reason that the author wrote this passage. Um, and so that can be kind of confusing to students because they recognize, they have that recognition of this phrase and they think that must be it. But if we remember what the difference between main ideas and supporting details are, then we know that that's just a detail. Present a concise history of the women's suffrage movement. Um, Students may have said maybe at A, uh, but there is no, there is not a, this is only talking about one single facet of this movement. And so it is not a history. So show the inaccuracy of a prediction about women's suffrage. So inaccurate means wrong. Prediction, guess. Let's see. They thought they would vote the same. They were guessing. They were wrong. Hmm. That's pretty strong. And D, explain the differences in voting behavior between men and women. Oh, they just tell us that a difference exists. They don't talk about what those differences are. So we know that it cannot be D. So if, we, if our student in question had um, A as one that they thought was a possibility because of that gender gap, okay, I again would have them go in and test it. So if I look even at my summarized version of this passage, is the whole thing pointing to the gender gap? No, we have lots of information showing talking about a prediction. This was about prediction. This was about a prediction. 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 Only in the end did we finally get to anything about the gender gap. So if most of the paragraph is about a prediction, then we know that that is likely to be the main idea. And so the answer for that one is going to be C. All right. The third question, this is one of those cause and effect questions. And it's, there's keywords that we need to look for in the um, question to help us uh, parse this one out because it is a particularly tricky one. Um, we have to keep track of what is happening and when it's happening. When we're annotating on the side, we really need to, to make a distinguishment between those two things. So um, the question says, which of the following, if true, would best serve to challenge Auburn and Thomas's belief that the discovery of calculus is an example of the phenomenon mentioned in the first sentence? I mentioned earlier that phenomenon is a frequent word, so this is definitely one I would want students to be tracking. Can we start a clean page here? We are on question three. So I will do A, B, C, D again. And then this question is even kind of wordy. So which of the following if true, would best serve to challenge Ogburn and Thomas's belief that the discovery of calculus is an example of the phenomenon mentioned in the first sentence. Okay, so we have the first sentence. We have challenge these people's belief. Okay, uh, we haven't read the passage yet, so this doesn't make a lot of sense, but there's a couple things that we can pull out even without reading the passage, and that is to challenge something means to disprove, right? To show that it's wrong. So we know that of these four options, 
Okay, one of them is going to show that it's wrong. The others either won't show that it's wrong or will show that it's right. We know this before we even read the passage. So we know that's what we're looking for. Okay. So, and then we also know to pay close attention to the passage in the first sentence. So I'm going to go ahead and annotate this one. Um, so the phenomenon, again, I would say the best, um, most concise synonym for phenomenon is event, right? It's a event that occurs. In this case, it says simultaneous. That's another good word to add to students. Thank you. That's another good word to add to students' vocabulary, and it means, of course, same time. So the phenomenon of simultaneous discovery so events that happen at the same time, discoveries happening, discovery happening at the same time. What science historians call multiples, okay, so this event is called, it has a name, and that's the name of it, turns out to be extremely common. So people discovering things at the same time is common. One of the first comprehensive lists of multiples was put together in 1922 by William Auburn and Dorothy Thomas. They found 148 major scientific discoveries that fit the multiples pattern. Okay, so there's a lot of words there. Uh, let's see, the first list of multiples. put together by, I'm just going to say, Auburn and Thomas. They found 148 major discoveries that were multiples. And again, what's a multiple? It's a discovery that happens at the same time. Okay. So working independently, both Newton and Leibniz discovered calculus. Ah, this is an example. I know it's an example because it's telling me that something happened at the same time and I had new people introduced. So example. Calculus discovered same time by Newton and Leibniz. So there's an example. Next, I have three mathematicians invented decimal fractions. So this has nothing to do with calculus. So I know it's another example. So I'll say another example. So three math people. invented decimal fractions. Let me go back to talking about Auburn and Thomas. So O and T, the sheer number of multiples can mean only one thing. Scientific discoveries must, in some sense, be inevitable. Inevitable may be a word that students aren't familiar with. Um, it, I would say adding it to their vocab list would not be a bad idea. Um, it is a pretty common word for some of these passages, not as common as phenomenon or simultaneous, but um, it, it's important, especially in this kind of tricky passage of knowing what inevitability is, knowing that something is unavoidable. Okay, so I would use that as a, as a synonym. So. I would say inevitable means 
It's unavoidable. It's going to happen no matter what. So I'm gonna read that again. For Offer and Thomas, the sheer number of multiples could mean only one thing. Scientific, scientific discoveries must, they said, discoveries must. Whenever I see must, never, always, I tell students, that's an important word. They must, in some sense, be unavoidable. And then he goes on to give some figurative language. They must be in the air or products of the intellectual climate of a specific time and place. Time is. So unpacking that a little bit with students, right? This is figurative language, but it means that because of things happening culturally at that time, it made sense. It was time for that thing to be evolved into the consciousness of people. And so that's essentially the theory that we're describing here. So if we go back to our original question, we know that it was referring to that first sentence. So which of the following and true would disprove or challenge ONT's belief that the discovery of calculus is an example of the phenomenon? What is the phenomenon? Multiples. Okay. So we're looking for the one thing that they said that would actually prove that they were wrong. Okay. So Uncovering the existence of a journal that Newton kept while working with calculus. Okay. This is where logic comes in. This one is a common sense one. We kind of have to ask the question. Okay. Could a scientist keep a journal while they were discovering something? Could two, could two scientists keep a journal while they were working on a problem and not show it to each other? Yes. Okay, so this is not proof of a problem. Learning that, so again, I'm going to cross off A. Learning that scientists other than Newton and Leibniz had also made substantial progress on calculus. So again, if two people could be discovering something at the same time. Could more than two people be discovering it at the same time? Sure, that, does, that is an evidence that the theory is wrong. So this would actually help prove that it's true, not challenge it. So we know that it can't be B. C, finding a previously unknown letter between Newton and Leibniz, or N and L, discussing calculus that predated, so pre is before dated, it's commonly assumed discovery. Okay, so we unpack this a little bit. We're saying, what if today we found a letter from one scientist to another scientist where they're talking about calculus together and it's before they revealed the discovery. Would this disprove the theory of multiples, that these things just happened on their own? Yeah, because this shows a direct line of communication between the two. So it wasn't just happening on its own. These things were happening um, as a result of communication. So, I would go, I would give that one an M. That is definitely a strong possibility, but I don't want to make a decision without reading all the answers. So D, identifying a minor error in Newton's original mathematical calculations. Um, if finding an error is not proof of a problem with the theory. The theory isn't about calculus. The theory is about people making discoveries at the same time. So not proof. 
and we've kind of already tested this one to say, to kind of work it out and unpack it. If we found that letter, we would know that they were communicating. So the theory of multiples is that things just unavoidably happen at the same time, but this would disprove it. And we know that that's what we're looking to do. So the answer would be C. Um, another, moving on to passage four, and I would start, so this is a lot of writing for students, right? Um, or maybe it's just that I write large. But if you, if we looked at this entire passage through the eyes of an English language learning student, um, we're going to find that it's extremely complex. It's intentionally difficult for um, English native English speakers. It's intentionally difficult. So imagine reading that through the lens of someone who's uh, first language is not English. Uh, so taking the time to essentially translate that into words they understand or to write down their best understanding of it is certainly a good time investment for that student and, and also for during the test. All right, so on to number four. Uh, this question says the passage suggests which of the following about, and I'm just going to say M, because the average student is not going to know what that word is, and I don't want them to get hung up over it as they're reading it. Um, another good strategy is to have students reading the questions out loud, and I know they might feel kind of strange about that at times. Um, in the testing center, uh, but they can read quietly to themselves without disturbing others, and it helps them to hear what's happening. So uh, again, I'm gonna annotate this, but so I am on question four. It's important for them to number the question that they're on so they're not looking at the wrong notes when they're trying to make decisions. So MC, a tree with leaves the size of a small child, evolved in heavily canopied forests in South America. So again, I'm just going to call this MC. I know it's a tree. Leaves the size of a small child, okay? Tree with large leaves. evolved in heavily canopied forests in South America. Okay, uh, canopied, not a common word at all. No reason for students to typically have this on their vocabulary list, but in the context of this passage, it is important. And so I ask students to think about um, the root word. What, what word do you recognize there? And, and often they'll say canopy, and I'll say, what is a canopy? And they'll talk about a bed, and I'll say, yes, exactly. So what makes a canopy bed different from another kind of bed? And they'll say, well, there's a cover over the top, and I'll say, yes, that's exactly um, what we have going on with this tree. So they've kind of decoded that, that word, um, that there's really no reasonable expectation that they would, that they would previously know. Um, when any tree falls and creates a light gap in these dense forest canopies, MC races to fill the gap. Okay, so if trees fall in the forest, MC races to fill the gap. So it's growing wherever the sunlight is hitting. And then it's creating kind of an umbrella over the rest of that forest. I'm getting a visual here as well. Uh, Pacific Island Forest, by contrast. By contrast is a key word. Whenever we see a word like contrast, we know we're talking about a difference. If we see the word compare, we're talking about similarities. If we see contrast, we're talking about differences. So I would ask students to just make a note. We're shifting here. We see a shift in the passage. There's a difference. 
So Pacific Island forests, by contrast, have airy, discontinuous canopy, canopies. So um, again, discontinuous, uh, you can break down what is the root word. They will say continue, discontinue, what does that mean? Follow it through logically, and um, they can see that it is the opposite of continuous. So these forests in the Pacific Islands are different. They're airy. So this one was more like an umbrella. And this one is more airy. So when M arrives in the Pacific Island forest, so when this plant arrives here, it has no canopy forest competitors. So no competitors for that sunlight. and fills all the light gaps. So it does exactly what it does in its own forest. Fills the gaps. Creating canopies as continuous as awnings under which few animals or other plants can live. And we could deconstruct awnings, but it's really not, a, it's not necessary at this point because they now understand canopies, they now understand continuous, so they get the idea. They don't have to know what that word means. We see that because there's no competitors for the sun, it fills the gaps, okay? Uh, and it says, under which few animals and other plants can live. It's like a biological desert under there, completely silent, one botanist laments. Botanist laments, obscure words, not all that important in this context, okay? We're thinking about that, um, that figurative language though, it's like a biological desert. If you think about what, it, ask students to think about what a desert reminds them of, right? There's not a lot of life, not a lot of greenery, completely silent, okay? So we're talking about a forest when a tree from South America gets moved to the Pacific Island because it has a different, it has a different nature than the trees in the Pacific Island, it makes it difficult for animals or plants to live in the forests where it comes. So um, walking back through that makes it a lot less wordy and a lot um, more straightforward to understand. So we're looking at the question again, the passage suggests, uh, which of the following about M? So that means, what is true? When you see the keyword suggests, it means what is true about M, about this different kind of tree? And remember that only one can be true. So you're essentially looking for things that make the others false. You're, as you read through these four possible answers, you're looking for things that are false, okay? So I'm going to have this out and say, um, A, it can destroy a natural habitat. Have we seen any evidence of that in, what we, in our notes here? I think we have when we see that few animals or plants can live. Um, we see some destruction there. So I would say strong maybe by A. For B, we see it adapts equally well to forests and deserts. Well, that's never mentioned. Uh, the only reference to a desert is uh, in figurative language, saying that it's like a biological desert. So that's never discussed. They only talk about it in its natural habitat, 
And in the Pacific Island forests, they never talk about it in the desert. C, it thrives primarily on tropical islands. Well, that's actually not true if we go back to this, because in the beginning, it tells us that this tree is from South America. It's only when it migrates to an island that it actually has problems. So we know that that's not true. And finally, it provides protection for some plant species. Well, while that might be true in their natural habitat, it's never mentioned in the passage. We don't have any reason to believe that. And we know that when it migrates to an island, it actually does the opposite of protect them, it kills them. So we're gonna mark off D. But again, we don't wanna take for granted that A must be right. We wanna go back and test it. And so again, A was, it can destroy a natural habitat. So we double check and make sure we found evidence for that. Indeed, we did right here. So we can move on with confidence and say that the answer is A. All right. Is this pace okay? Okay. All right, so question five. This is the one about um, the author who grew up in a family of storytellers. And uh, we can look at the question and see that it says the quoted words rise, break, and fall prim primarily refer to the, and then we have our options. So the words rise, break, and fall, whenever we have a quote pulled out of context as part of our question, uh, we know we're gonna be trying to figure out what does this mean? What's this mean? So as we read through this passage, we will keep in mind that that's our goal, is to figure out what that means. So A, B, C, D. This is question five. So author Louise Erdrich grew up in a family of storytellers and thus learned to appreciate the world of possibilities invoked by a storyteller's voice. Okay, so I just, uh, when I have really long words or long names, I just abbreviate them so that students aren't hung up with trying to remember that. So we're just gonna call her L. L grew up in a family of storytellers. Okay, so I grew up with storytellers. And learned to um, appreciate the world of possibilities invoked by a storyteller's voice. Okay, uh, they may or may not know what invoked means, but we have this idea of voice, right? She liked the voice in the stories. So that's one thing we know. She must have also been attracted to the sounds and rhythms of stories. Okay, so she also liked sounds. Rhythms is a word um, that typically isn't too hard to teach, so I would definitely put that on a vocab list um, because it's pretty easy for students to um, memorize what rhythms are. So she also liked the sounds and the rhythms of the stories. And here we see the quote that we're gonna be trying to unpack in just a minute. So as she puts it to the, the stories, Rise, break, and fall. For in her own telling of tales, she strives to position her readers to hear a story told. Okay. So she's a storyteller, but unlike her family that told stories out loud, we know that she's an author. That very first word of this passage is author. So she wants 
her readers to, and here is in quotation marks, which indicates a non-literal or a figurative meaning. So she wants readers to hear her stories, even though they are in fact reading and not listening. Encouraged by her parents, Erdrich began writing stories uh, when she was a child, okay? So she started writing as a child. During that time, she began to experiment with the writer's voice, but she also spent her childhood observing and listening, okay? So she experimented with writer's voice. Now, if, you, if your student has an English background, they may have some context um, for which to understand what's meant by writer's voice. If they don't have a strong English or literature background, uh, that bears pointing out. So they're aware again of these things that seem to be in conflict, right? Readers hearing something that isn't spoken. Writers voicing or speaking something that isn't spoken. So kind of pointing out that contrast um, is important to understanding the context of this passage. Um, and then finally, there's a quote from the author, and she says, I was, the only, I was the one who listened to everything. So she listened to everything. Okay, so again, if we go back to the question, we know that the quoted words rise, break, and fall. What did the, does that mean? Well, we know it's figurative language, it's a metaphor, so we're going to go through and find out. Uh, for A, does the rise, break, and fall mean the typical plot lines of many children's stories? Well, if we go back to the sentence that has that, right, it doesn't say anything about children's stories, right? It just says the rhythms of stories or their rise, break, and fall. So, and it doesn't say anything about plot lines either. Plot is the way that a story develops. So this is simply not discussed. It might be true, but it's not discussed. So for A, I would say no. Suspenseful moments and many spoken stories. Well, we've already established that she's an author, she's writing for readers, and she's working on her writer's voice. So these are not spoken stories. She grew up listening to spoken stories, but that's not what she does. Her job is to write. And so we would say, these are not about spoken stories, suspenseful moments and many spoken stories. Again, if your students have a um, English background, they might understand the narrative arc, which has a rise, a break, and a fall. And if they do, you can point out to them that the suspenseful part, the tension, is usually only the rise and the break. So in that context, uh, the fall would not be relevant to suspenseful moments. The fall is typically the resolution where things kind of decline. So uh, with different students, different things might work. So um, if they're familiar with narratives or stories, that might work for helping to explain that. Uh, C, emotions experienced by those listening to stories. She doesn't talk about emotions. She talks about rhythms. She talks about sounds. She talks um, about writer's voice. So she's not even talking about emotions, okay? She may care about those things, but we have no evidence of it from this passage. So there's no reason for us to draw that conclusion. And D, so the answer is of course D, the cadences characteristic of oral storytelling. 
Now, how to get students to understand that this would be the answer um, is, is where it comes in to be a little bit difficult because if they don't know what rhythms are, they probably don't know what cadences mean either and that they're synonyms for one another, rhythms and cadences. Um, so working with students on specific words like that can be helpful, uh, but even if, let's say, that student, because when that student's in the testing center, we're not there with them. So if they get a word like that and they, they don't have um, the context to put that together. We're just looking at, we could say C, characteristic of oral storytelling. Well, we've said that A, B, and C could not be. So that means by default, D has to be at least a possibility, right? So we don't know what cadences is, we'll, we'll just assume that a student does not know. So we'll just call it C, characteristic of oral storytelling. If we go back to our annotations, in nearly every line, we have a reference to how this author uses things that are similar to oral storytelling in her writing. So even if they, that student can't figure out on their own what cadences means, there's evidence to support that D is the answer. All right. So question six is strictly a um, vocabulary question. So these, of course, uh, don't overdo it with student vocabulary. Uh, in my opinion, these are ones to use some knowledge of prefixes and suffixes and root words with, um, but I would not make exhaustive lists of like SAT uh, vocab words or things like that because we really want students to focus on the strategies right, to make sense of these passages rather than memorizing um, really obscure words. They're more likely to get, to get these correct if they're just kind of narrowing down their options based on what they understand from prefixes and root words than um, if we try to have them rote memorize them. Um, if they're gonna miss any questions, I'll, me personally, I would prefer that it be vocabulary questions uh, because there's not nearly as many of them as there are the other kinds of questions. So, but just to kind of break down one of these for you, I would say, uh, obviously it tells us that the blank has a missing word. That's our first indication that it's a vocab question. Uh, Dr. Wan or Dr. Y headed a medical team that was highly blank in that it represented multifarious specialties and varied experiences. So this is a layered issue. We have vocab right in the question as well. So whatever this, we know we're looking for a synonym for something that we likely don't recognize in the first place. So what I say to students is, okay, is there any part of this word multifarious? Is there any part of this word that you recognize? And typically they'll say multi, and I'll say, what does multi mean? And they'll say many, more than one. I say, great, so let's write that down, right? Many. Specialties, they're typically, students are familiar with what that means. And varied experiences, well, what does it mean to be varied? What does varied remind you of? And I'll say, mm, very happy. And I'll say, no, not that kind of very. And they'll say, mm. I say, look at the word. And they might say variety. They may not, but if they do, it's typically what they go to. So they have, so then kind of rereading the sentence and saying, let me put these down. Okay, Dr. Wan headed, so Dr. Y headed a team that had many specialties and a variety of experiences. So they've essentially rewritten this sentence in their own words. And I know that I'm looking for 
a synonym for this because that's what comes after the blank. All right, my options are assiduous, eclectic, remunerative, and cohesive. The odds of students knowing any of these words right at the top of their head is one to none. And so I would say this is one of those times where I don't want them to throw up their hands and say, well, I, I just can't get this one. Uh, because we can at least narrow it down by looking at some root words and some prefixes so that their guess is, you know, 50-50 uh, instead of one, you know, one and four. So um, I'll ask them to look at re, right? Re is a word we see, or a part of word that we see in front of lots of things. And I'll say, what does re mean? And they'll, they'll say, to do again, right? We don't know exactly what that means, but it has something to do with doing something again. What does co cohesive mean? And they'll, they'll say, co. So think of some words with co as a prefix. Um, co parent, co pilot, co. Oh, it's when you do something together, right? It's doing something together, right? It goes together. Um, assiduous, right? It's its own word. Eclectic, it's its own word. There's not really much to break down there, but if they've done this work, okay, they can test those two words against their own paraphrase here, Dr. Y had a team that had many specialties and a variety of experiences, okay? So if there's, if you have a team and there's lots of different specialties and experiences happening, uh, we wouldn't see that those things necessarily naturally go together, right? We're not like a co-pilot, right? They're very similar. They have the same skills. They do the same things together. Um, it doesn't imply anything about doing something again, right? Uh, so they can perhaps narrow this one down so that they know it's either A or B and then take their best guess. And that's honestly my best advice for how to approach those. Um, and again, to spend, spend more time uh, working on strategies than trying to memorize um, obscure words that may not even be on the test. All right, so number seven. Number seven, we are um, looking at a question that says, the author includes and defines the words, and I always just say G and G, um, for a couple of reasons. One, I don't speak Latin or French, and I can't really pronounce them, but also because students don't need to get hung up on them. So I always have students just say G and G. We will just call these G and G. So seven, A, B, C, D. Um, I know this seems redundant, but honestly, the difference between having a piece of paper and writing these things out and being able to see what you're eliminating, um, as opposed to trying to visualize it being crossed out on a computer screen, the difference is huge. And so I, I know it seems redundant, but it really is helpful. To the greatest degree possible, we want to help students make this feel like it's a pen and paper test because that's the way they do reading best, even though that's not how this test is um, facilitated. So strictly speaking, G, right, are spouts carved on the outside of a building. Okay, so I'm getting a visual description here. They protrude from a roof gutter and are designed to direct water away from the roof. So I could do, a, I could approach this in a couple different ways. Because it's literally giving me a visual description of architecture, I could draw this, right? I could draw this or I could use that same annotation technique that I've been doing, kind of putting in my own words. But for this one, I'm gonna illustrate how I might draw this one out. So strictly speaking, G's are spouts carved on the outside of a building. So I'm gonna draw, and I'm not an artist, but I'm gonna draw a building of some sort, okay? And it says a spout, okay? 
carved on the outside of a building, they protrude, I may or may not know what that means, but from a roof gutter. So I know it's a spout, I know this is the roof, it comes out of here in some way. I'm gonna draw a spout. I know what a gutter is. If I don't, I still have the spout for reference, okay? And it's designed to direct, so I've got, it's gonna direct water away from the roof. Okay. The word G comes from the old French G and the late Latin G. So, old French G, late Latin G. The only reason I'm writing this down is because it's actually part of the question. So, I want to make sure that I am identifying that this is the word, not the actual thing itself, but the word that it says comes from here. And both of these things mean throat. So what does a throat do? Throat helps swallow. Move food, liquid, rain, down. That's what a throat does. So I'm just kind of doing these word associations since I know that the question has been, has asked me to identify why these words were used. Uh, what we usually think of, let me go back to my picture here, what we usually think of gargoyles as being carved in the shapes of, it says grotesque, again, an obscure word, so just G, animals or people, Okay, so sometimes, I might put a note here, sometimes G's look like people or animals. Some are undecorated, so not all. Serving a purely utilitarian function. So again, utilitarian, we can ask, have students ask themselves, does this remind you of any other word? Often they'll say utilities, they can, they can um, associate with pain bills or having something that you need, right? Um, something that you have to do. That's not getting them exactly to the definition of that, but it's giving them enough of an idea that they can make the next cognitive leap, okay? So, some of them are carved, not all of them. Some of them have just a function. Okay, so this is the visual we have in our head. Let's look at that question and the possible answers again. So the author includes and defines the words G and G primarily to describe the physical appearance of gargoyles. Okay, so we're going to take a look at um, those specific words, G and G. Where do they occur? So if we look in that sentence, those words actually don't describe the appearance. Now this can be, this can be a very tricky question because most of the passage is actually talking about the um, the appearance of uh, giving a visual appearance of what these things look like. Uh, but this particular sentence is making an association between where the word for it comes from and what those words meant in other languages. So it really isn't related to its appearance, but rather its function. So that can be a little bit hard to unpack. It can take a little time. So students might actually choose maybe on that one at first. They might be iffy. Um, B, to connect the name and function of gargoyles. Okay, so if I go back to my annotations, I have, okay, the word. So these were the names, yes. This is a function, I have function here. 
that's a possibility. So B, I'm going to say possibility again. C, establish the geographical origin of gargoyles. Again, this is another one that students often choose. They select C because they think of the word French and the word Latin, and they start thinking of geography, of place. But these are actually languages, not places that they're talking about. And so um, geography is a map place, okay? This is... Um, architecture, which does not necessarily have anything to do with the map. And it's also, these two words are about language, not place. So, uh, in all honesty, students would probably have something that looks like this at this point with the three M's there. Like, I'm really not sure. Um, D, suggest the artistic and cultural value of G's. Well, this is never even discussed, so that's not even part of the uh, passage. So we know we can get rid of that one and then go back and start to test some of these other ones. Um, so describe the physical appearance of gargoyles. Is that what this specific sentence does? No. Connect the name and function of gargoyles. We've kind of established that that is something that happens here. The name, right? We have the name, name, and throat, which has a function. That's testing pretty strong, but we'll look at C just to make sure. Establish the geographical origin of gargoyles. They never really tell us where these things came from or where we first saw them. So if we have to pick the strongest possibility, it's going to be B. Because we can't argue with anything in that one. It really is the strongest. All right, question eight. This one is another one that is a little bit um, tricky. So. We have a couple of different strategies to approach this one with. Uh, it says, the question first, the passage implies that the true cause of the bridge collapse was, okay, whenever we see the words cause, because, or as a result of in a question, we know that we're looking at a cause and effect question. And so the one thing that students should, should understand is that whatever comes after the word because, right? If we're writing this out, whatever comes after because is the cause. Whatever comes before because is the effect, okay? X happened because Y, right? X is the effect, or yes, the effect, and Y is the cause. So in this case, we... This passage implies that the true cause of the bridge collapse, which is the effect, was what? So we are looking for the cause. So knowing that right off the bat is going to help make this complex question a little um, easier to follow along with for students. So um, this is question eight. A, B, C, and D. The first Tacoma Narrows Bridge in Tacoma, Washington, right off the bat, way more words than we need, okay? So uh, I'm gonna start annotating this. So we're gonna say bridge in Washington. Open to traffic on July 1st, 1940. Opened in 1940. Uh, the bridge, was, which was intended to withstand high winds, okay, so intended or supposed to um, withstand, uh, again, you could break that word down for students if they're not familiar with it, but they could also just um, skip over it, because if you skip that word, you just call it W, right? The bridge was intended to W high winds, 
collapsed for four months later on November 7th, 1940. So do you think that a bridge is ever intended to not do well with high winds when we go through the trouble of building them now? So we can just use context to figure that out. Okay, so the bridge was intended to, um, I'll say handle, because that might be a more familiar word, high winds. Uh, but it collapsed, it fell apart. Four months later. Due to, due to is part of cause and effect, right? So what comes after due to is going to be cause, right? The collapsed was the effect due to whatever comes next is the cause. So I'm gonna pay close attention to what comes next. Due to a physical phenomenon, so again, an event known as, it says arrow, uh, arrow elastic flutter, but we're just gonna say due to an event, A, F. F or flutter is a self-feeding vibration. So I'm just going to pick out the words that a student would probably know. F is vibration that occurs when A forces. So happens when A forces. on an object couple with the structure's natural mode of vibration. So couple means together, right? So forces on an object comes together with natural vibration. So I've written a lot of symptoms here, but it's still really hard to follow. So I'm gonna go through and make sure that I understand that. So a, a bridge in Washington opened in 1940. It was intended, intended to handle high winds, but it collapsed four months later due to or because of an event called AF. Now F or flutter is vibration that happens when this, forces an object and it comes together with it, with its own natural vibration. So I'm gonna say like there's two, I'm drawing a picture here. There's two sources of vibration and they are coming together to try and make sense of that mumbo jumbo in that sentence, okay? All right. Thanks to the um, thanks to the Tacoma collapse. Okay, so I remember seeing Tacoma in that first line. So bridge in T Washington. I just added T up there in Tacoma since I see the word again. So thanks to the Tacoma collapse, engineers will never again overlook the problem of flutter. Okay, so engineers actually learn something from this collapse. It has influenced the design of every great long span bridge built since 1940. So engineers learned something and used it on every bridge since then. So it was a tragedy, but they learned something and applied it to things in the future. So let's look at the question again. It says the passage implies that the true cause of the bridge collapsing was what? So if we look at A, low quality materials, the materials are never even mentioned in this passage. So we're gonna go here and cross that out. 
Short-sighted design, okay? So what does short-sighted mean? This might be something you wanna put on, um, on a vocab list, because again, kind of like rhythm, it's easy to, to kind of remember this, and it's not as obscure. So it just means you did not foresee it or did not anticipate something, right? So short-sighted means did not see it. So I'm not sure about that, so a student would probably mark that as a um, Substandard craftsmanship. Well, craftsmanship is the way that something is built. Um, there was a problem with the way this was built, but substandard usually implies it was done sloppily, right? Like it was done messy. And so, um, again, students may not, especially our English language learners, may not have a firm grasp of those two words. So this might go on their M list for a maybe. Um, so we might go M right there. Okay. D, unexpectedly high winds. Well, it actually says that the bridge was intended to withstand high winds. So they, they did expect it. So we know that D is not correct. So we have this narrowed down to B and C, so then we'll go in and we'll do our test. Is it true that there was substandard craftsmanship? If your student knows what those words mean, they know that that's never said. If your student doesn't know what those words mean, have them test B. B says uh, it means the bridge collapsed because they did not see it. And that is in fact the case, because once they did see it, Right? The whole rest of this says, once they did see it, they did something different. Okay? So we, by narrowing it down, we determined that it was actually B. All right, and on to number nine. We are getting closer to the end here. <clears throat> number nine is also a cause and effect passage. Okay, um, again, this one is a little bit, sit here for a minute. Again, this one is a little bit um, wordy. It's science-based. It's talking, and some of the language is a bit antiquated as well, uh, talking about cosmologies and um, astronomers and, and things that, words like baffled. Uh, so this one needs a little unpacking as well for most students. But, um, the passage indicates that ancient astronomers were baffled because um, we can try and see if we can figure out what baffled means in context once we read the passage, okay? because a lot of students aren't going to be familiar with that word. Um, so again, the strategy, the best strategy for approaching this is the annotation or the paraphrasing on the side. So it says, from the earliest times, the complications inherent in deciphering the movements of planets in the night sky must have seemed a curse to baffled astronomers. Holy smokes. That whole sentence, right? We have, from the earliest times, the complications inherent in deciphering the movements of planets in the night sky must have seemed a curse, maybe a curse, to baffled astronomers. There's a lot of language here that is not intuitive, but is a bit obscure um, for testing students. So um, let's see what we can make sense of this if we, if we leave out any of those words. So from the earliest times, the complications, which I know are problems, right? So we know we're talking about early times. Problems with movements of planets 
in the night sky. I'm just going to write down what I know, what I can make sense of. Must have seemed like a curse. So usually when I am, um, usually when I'm working with students, I will uh, talk about what a curse is because they typically have some kind of cultural context for understanding that and then it, it just clicks. It doesn't take a lot of time. So it seems like a curse to B and we, we know we need to figure out what B means to baffle astronomers. Still don't know necessarily what these are or what this is, but hopefully we'll figure that out. We know that it's people who are looking at the night sky, right? Looking for planets in the night sky. So maybe planet watchers. Okay. In the long run, though, they proved a blessing to the development of cosmology of C. So what was a curse, right, ended up being a blessing to the development of C. Okay. The study of the physical universe. Oh, great. So it gives me the definition of C. I now know what cosmology is. The study of the universe. Great. Now I have more information. Had the C motions, which is a different C, it's celestial, right? Had the C motions been simple. So if the C motions were simple, it might have been possible to explain them solely in terms of the simple poetic tales that had characterized the early cosmologies. A lot to unpack there. So if the motions were simple, okay? They could be explained simply. Again, if your students have some kind of um, English background and they're really just brushing up, they may ha have some understanding of what a simple poetic tale is. If they don't, it's really not worth the time investment to try and flesh that out. Okay, if they can pick up on this, this connection between if the motions were simple, they could be explained simply. Okay, if they can just pick up on that, that's a better use of time. Um, that had characterized the earlier cosmologies, which we know was the earlier study of the universe. Instead, these motions pr proved to be so intricate, maybe they know, maybe not, and subtle, again, that astronomers could not predict them accurately without eventually coming to terms with the physical reality or how and where the sun, moon, and planets move in real three-dimensional space. Again, a lot of garbled, um, intentionally difficult words there. So we have part one, we have part two. Let's break this down into a third part. So, um, the motions were, I'm just going to say I and S, intricate and subtle. Um, so, astronomers or planet watchers. could not predict them accurately. Predict should be a vocab word that everyone knows um, because that could very easily appear in a question too. What kind of a prediction could you make based on this information, right? So they could not predict them accurately. 
without eventually coming to terms with reality. Okay, so without accepting the reality of how and where the sun, moon, and planets move in real three-dimensional space. Okay. Because it's complex, it bears going through again. So in early times, there were problems with move, the movements of the planets in the night sky. So they seemed to curse to baffled astronomers or these planet watchers. Now that we've got more information, we can kind of start to infer that baffled means confused. They were utterly confused, okay? So now we have a synonym, hopefully. Confused, puzzled, um, something of that nature. It, but the curse actually turned out to be a blessing uh, to the development of cosmology, which is the study of the universe. If the sea motions were simple, they could have been explained simply. But they weren't. The motions were I and S. We don't know what that means, maybe. So, so they couldn't predict them accurately without accepting the reality of how and where the sun, moon, and planets were in three-dimensional space. So again, we have this idea that the curse right, actually turned out to be a blessing. The curse became a blessing. They were confused, but because of their confusion, they continued to search for answers. Had it been easy, they wouldn't have kept searching. It says if it could have been answered simply, they would have just left it at that. So really sitting and kind of reasoning through this process, right? This is a chronological process. Reasoning through the different parts of it and really understanding is going to help a student make a better selection for the answers. So here we have um, the passage indicates that ancient astronomers were baffled because, because we see because, we know it's a cause and effect question, right? Because whatever comes after because is the cause. The effect is that they were baffled, so we know we're looking to figure out why. So a, their observation disproved the poetic tales of early cosmologies. Um, we can put a maybe there. We know that their, their observation didn't match up, but it didn't necessarily disprove it, right? So that's a, that's a solid maybe. B, they lacked the mathematical sophistication needed to calculate astronomical distances. This is never even mentioned. So we're gonna take a hard pass on that one. C, their theories of planetary movements were more complicated than the movements themselves. Often students will choose this answer, okay? Because it's intentionally tricky. Okay, so again, that's where having this written out and being able to go back and look at it will help you, okay? The theories of the movements were more complicated than the movements themselves. It actually says the move, if the movements were simple, they could be explained simply. So we can infer from that that they weren't simple, okay? So the movements were more complicated than the movement, or the theories of the movements were more complicated than the movies themselves. The opposite is true. The theories were simple. The movements were complex. So this is the opposite of the truth. So we know it can't be C. D, they could not reliably predict observable celestial phenomenon. 
Well, I go back to some of my annotations. I have exactly that there. Could not predict, right? Could not predict. I see that language over here. So could not predict. So that's a solid M again as well. So I'm going to test it. And I see it says, um, so I'm testing A and D. Their observation disproved the poetic tales of early cosmologies uh, or of early C. So their observation didn't really disprove anything. Their observation just showed them that they were wrong about some things, okay? It didn't, it had to do way more calculating to get to that. So that one's not very strong. D, they could not reliably predict observable C events. In each of these three sections of annotating, we have evidence for that, that supports that one. So I'm gonna say of the two, A and D, D has the most support. So I'm gonna go with that, because as a student, I'm going to think that's a safe bet. <clears throat> There's lots of evidence for that. All right. 10 is another vocabulary question. So we're just looking at straight vocab here. Um, so the same kind of, truly the same strategies we used for the last vocabulary will be done here. So it says Saul Williams has won critical acclaim as a musician, poet, and actor, demonstrating that he is both V, for versatile, and melodic, modest, accomplished, or overcommitted. So I'll have students take a look at this and say, do you recognize any of these words? And often they'll say, you know, perhaps this reminds them of melody. Um, maybe they know what modest means, maybe. Um, accomplished got things done, right? Over committed, committed too much. The problem with this one is that if you don't understand uh, what versatile means, you have to use a context clues to figure that out otherwise. Um, so if we go back and we say, He's won critical acclaim as a musician, a poet, and an actor. So if I think about that, if I step away from the, the sentence and I think about a person in real life, okay, so you've been a musician and a poet and an actor. You've been a very busy person doing a lot of different kinds of things, demonstrating that he is both V and, well, I don't know what V is, but I know this guy does a lot of things. He does a lot of different things. I'm going to say he's probably talented. Um, these are just things that I'm inferring from the sentence. So, um, Melody, is he both, does he have melody? Possibly he's a musician. Is he modest? If I know what that means, I know not necessarily. Um, accomplished, he can get things done. Uh, he, it sounds like he's accomplished quite a bit or committed too much. This one is really where you're, you're a person could make that leap, that cognitive leap, but there's no evidence for it, okay? It doesn't say he was getting to appointments late or he was not showing up on time or, or things like that. So it's actually not stated. If you understand what that word means, it's actually not stated. So we're kind of left with, and doesn't say anything about being modest. So we're saying he does a lot of different things. He's talented. Um, melody only has to do really with one of these things. So if I had to choose between A and C, I'm, at least I've narrowed it, and I'm guessing that C is stronger. He's gotten a lot of things done. 
So that's the way I would reason through that particular one. So these words are a little less obscure, so students can typically do a little more with them than, than the ones we saw in the other question. All right. <clears throat> On to 11. So, again, we have a primary purpose question here. So, uh, we know we're looking for the main idea. It says, what is the primary purpose of this message or of this passage? So, absolutely, we know we're looking for the main idea. Um, when a world record is broken in a track and field event, the athlete who broke the record typically receives a great deal of attention. Okay, so I'm gonna annotate some of this, just change this to 11 here. So we're talking about track events, breaking record, records. Getting attention. The breaking of certain world records, however, receives more attention than others. Okay, so some records get more attention. Perhaps there is no more famous track and field milestone than Roger Bannister's running a mile in under four minutes in 1954. Okay, so I'm gonna say Roger, uh, Roger B was famous for running a mile under four minutes. 1954. Prior to Bannister's feat, the four-minute mark had been considered beyond the limits of human ability. Wow. Okay, beyond the limits of what humans are capable of. So, before he did it, uh, people didn't think it could be done. All right, so now we're gonna figure out what's the main idea. We've got lots of details in here. Um, let's figure out what the one um, piece of evidence is that the whole passage is really supporting. Um, so, what is the primary purpose of the passage? To compare Bannister to other record-breaking athletes. Do they, are any record-breaking athletes mentioned? Besides Bannister here, no. So right away, I can get rid of A. To summarize Bannister's career as an athlete, um, actually, they only have one sentence here about something that happened in his career. So I doubt that that is a summary of his entire career. I doubt that as a track and field athlete, he showed up to track on his first day ever, broke a world record and walked away, because that's what that would imply. So B, no, this is not a history of his career as an athlete. To provide context for Bannister's achievement. Well, there is a lot of context set here about track events and breaking records in general. Some records get more attention. Here's what Bannister did. Here's why it was pretty impressive. So really there's a lot of context here for showing why it's important. So that's, so C is gonna stay in M and then D. To show that Bannister coined the term milestone. That's not ever mentioned. The word milestone is in the text, right? So this can confuse students. They can cling to that and say, oh, that word's in there, so that must be it. 
um, but we want them thinking beyond that uh, because that actual uh, what that what D is saying is never even um, said. So we go back to C. We test it uh, again. Is it providing context for banners achieve for banisters achievement? We look at all of our notes and we confirm that in fact that is true. So we can move on. We can say C with confidence and move on. All right, number 12. This particular question is asking us to look at um, a detail. So not necessarily the main idea, although understanding what the main idea is can help us understand why a detail is, a particular detail is used. And that's what it is actually asking us to do. So let's read the question. I'm gonna set my page. 12, A, B, C, D, okay. Um, the author mentions the bestseller lists and the Book of the Month Club to emphasize Rain Tree County's what? Okay, so the author mentions the bestseller lists and the Book of the Month Club to emphasize what right so we want to know why did the author include these details that's what we're looking for all right, in 1948, Ross Lockridge's novel, Rain Tree County. Okay, so now we have some context for that. It's a book, right? It's a novel. So I'm gonna just call him L. So L's novel or L's book, Rain Tree County, led the bestseller list and was chosen as a book of the month club selection. So this is right in the first sentence, okay? So the things, the very things that I'm looking at in the question are right here. So bestseller, book of the month club. So this is from the very beginning, we're getting this information. The 1,000 page narrative, so, okay, there's a thousand pages. I don't know if that's important or not, but I'm gonna write it down because I understand it. The 1,000 pages set in 19th century Indiana, okay, and 19th century Indiana, unapologetically aspired to be the great American novel. Um, most students, again, who are unfamiliar uh, with, with English uh, as a discipline are maybe not gonna understand that term, the great American novel, okay? Um, so they can, they can kind of move on past that and just see that um, it's something that he wanted to be successful. Sadly, it was the only book I would write. Okay, so it's the only book he wrote. And they use the word sadly. So when there's emotional language, I always kind of take note of that. Um, after his death that same year, the novel sank into O, oh, which is obscurity, but students probably won't know that. Um, after his death that same year, the novel sank into O, oh, though a film adaptation starring Elizabeth Taylor and Montgomery Clift was released in 1957. So even though I don't know perhaps what obscurity means, um, I'm going to say after his death, so he died, right? He died that year. His book, we'll just say sank, because we understand that word probably. Um, but 
It was made into a movie. These are the things that most students would be able to pull out of this in their own words. So let's go back and look at these questions. Um, the author mentions the bestseller list, these details, why are they being used? Um, the bestseller list and the book of the month club to emphasize Rain Tree County's what? Limited readership. Well, let's see. It was a bestseller. It was a book of the month club book, okay? So limited readership, with limited readers would mean very few. So if it's a bestseller, we know that that's not the case, right? So we can get rid of A. It's enduring appeal. So if the student knows what enduring means, then they you know, know that that means lasting appeal. If they don't, they can still look at that word appeal, you know, something that appeals to you, something that you like. Um, and look at the question again. The author mentions the, um, the bestseller and the book of the month club to emphasize its appeal. It's what appeal? Not, if I'm not sure what this word means, I might put an M by B. Because if it's popular, it has some kind of appeal, right? So C is commercial success. Commercial being business success. So why does the author mention that it was a bestseller, book of the month club? Could that be related to success? Strong possibility. So I'm going to put an M there. D, artistic aspirations. Well, even if I don't know what aspirations means, I can try to break it down. Student might be familiar with the word aspire, maybe not. Um, but the artistic something about it. Being a bestseller and being part of the Book of the Month Club doesn't really say anything about the artistic value of this piece, right? It means it was successful. It means a lot of people read it, but it doesn't really mean that it was artistic. So even if we aren't sure about this word, we can narrow it down to D because we already have two pretty strong ones that it's likely to be, B and C. So, <clears throat> so essentially it comes down to which one feels like a better reason to include these two details. That it was successful or that it was appealing. I would say success, but even if a student only gets it narrowed down to those two, again, they've improved their odds of getting closer to that correct answer. Um, but the answer is, of course, it's commercial success. That's why the author of this passage included that information. Because he could have said, you know, he could have um, written all of these other things about the book and never said this first sentence. He said it to tell us that the book was successful for a period of time. All right, and last but not least, we have passage 13. I'll flip over a page here. All right. So in this question, we are again looking for primary purpose. The primary purpose of the passage is to, so we know that we are looking for the main idea. We're gonna use the annotation again. In my, so we have a first person talking here. In my 1983 essay, Lifting the veil, shattering the silence. Black women's history and slavery and freedom. I noted the limited number of primary sources about black women. 
That's a really long sentence. Let's break it down. Okay, so in her 1983 essay, and then there's a title, okay? That title may be important. If it is, we can go back to it. If it's not, we don't wanna get bogged down in the words, right? Okay, so the 1983 essay, here's the title. I noted the limited number of primary sources about black women. So primary, right, means kind of original. So there are limited original sources about black women. So she was writing an essay, doing some research, looking for sources, couldn't find many, okay? The essay is based largely upon the few available secondary sources, unpublished D's, dissertations, and the, rate, the rare manuscript collections that were available to me. So she used secondary sources, unpublished, a student may or may not know what a dissertation is, so just say unpublished, work or sources and the rare manuscript so rare manuscripts so we have secondary unpublished and rare sources that were available to her actually that essay was written with several purposes in mind ah we see this word purpose we know we're looking for the purpose but this there may be a connection we don't want to read too much into it but it should perk up our ears Okay, um, the essay was written with several purposes in mind. So what are those purposes? Several purposes. One, raising the awareness of neglect was uppermost. Okay. Raising awareness. But an equally important task, let me put neglect in here. Uh, an equally important task was to indicate the topics in need of further research. Ah, so to talk about future research topics. It is encouraging that in recent years, many historians and graduate students have taken up these challenges. Ah, okay, great. People are now doing it. People are now doing these things. Okay, so I've taken the wordiness out of this, put it into, um, my own understanding, okay, it's not word for word, it's just paraphrased, and I'm going to go back to the questions. So the primary purpose of this passage is to do what? Encourage more schools to incorporate Black women's studies into their curriculum. Well, that would be a leap. That would be a leap, and here's why. It's not talking about other schools or universities or anything like that. Um, we could infer that that would probably make this woman happy to see that happening, but it isn't explicitly stated. It isn't even um, hinted at in this. So I'm going to say no. The evidence is not there for it. To discuss the content the purpose and the ramifications, whatever that is, of a particular essay, okay? Um, ramifications, I'm not sure. I've really only seen it a couple times in these sample tests, so it may or may not be something we wanna spend time on, but for me, I like to use the synonym outcomes of that word, so if you decide to, um, tutor students on the meaning of that, I would use outcomes uh, of a particular essay. So discuss the content, 
purpose and outcomes of a particular essay. So we know we're talking about an essay, right? Um, the title tells us what it's about. This is where she got her information. So we have the content, yeah. Oh, there's purpose. She talks about the purpose. And the ramifications or the outcomes, people are not doing these things. So I actually see content, purpose, and outcomes of this essay present. So I'm gonna put a strong M there because I never wanna settle on one until I've read them all. There might be a better answer. C, trace the history of politically active black women in the United States. This is, this is there's nothing about politics is explicitly mentioned in this, so we can narrow that one out. And D, to caution historians against ignoring key primary source materials. She's not really raising any cautions. Uh, and in fact, it sounds like she did um, a lot of hard work and a lot of due diligence in, in searching out primary source materials on her own. They really just didn't exist back then. So I don't think um, that that one makes sense either. So again, I would go back, I would test B, discuss the content, purpose, and outcomes of a particular essay. We have everything above here is content related. Everything from here to here is purpose related. And this end is outcomes related. So it passes the test. Uh, the answer is yes, B is correct. Um, this is the main idea. Uh, something interesting that this particular question shows or sheds light on is that oftentimes um, we might read between the lines and think that we know this author better than we actually do because of the topic of her essay, the things that she advocated for. We might be guessing, filling in the blanks about some of her political meanings or things that she thinks are important. But it's not asking us to make an inference. It's not asking us to guess or you know, to make a leap in judgment or what would make sense given this information. It's specifically saying, what's the main idea here? Okay, so we don't want to read between the lines. We want to read what it says and make our choices based on that. All right, so we have worked through all 13 of the reading one or reading test one questions. Um, all right, there I am. So uh, again, we're at, let's see, we've been doing this for about two hours, two hours and a half to 15, two hours and 15 minutes. Uh, that's not an unreasonable amount of time for a student to spend uh, practicing a test or testing, honestly, but it, it's really um, pretty, it's a pretty fair amount of time uh, for a student to use, but there should be breaks because even I, even me just talking through that is getting um, a little tired and a little uh, worn out from that. So definitely encourage students to take frequent breaks. Remind them that they can write, 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 write while they're in there. They can't bring in any writing. They can't leave with any writing, but they can do lots of writing there. They can take breaks. Um, and to take their time and to never settle for um, frustrated answers, right? Um, take their time with each one, treat each one as if it's a test unto itself um, so that they can do their very best. We don't need perfection, um, but the more time and, and meaning making that students are engaging with um, each question, it will help improve their outcomes. And, when we're talking sometimes about a matter of just a couple of points, uh, really spending that extra time or taking that break and being refreshed can make 
all the difference in the world. So um, that's all I have today. I hope that I've helped make a little bit of sense of this. Of course, you'll all have your own strategies that you like to use um, with students, but these are the ones that I've been using. Um, and uh, a lot of students have said that when they're writing the themes down and putting them in their own words, that it's really helped them a lot. Also the eliminating answers that are incorrect. So those might be the two strongest strategies um, out of all of them. All right, so thank you very much and uh, happy tutoring. Good luck with your students.